most people are familiar you know, with Timothy Leary, the kind of Harvard psychologist who was who was caught up in, well, put himself in the middle of all of this stuff with his rather large ego. Um, and he often gets the kind of blame as as the person who you know, was telling all the kids of America to turn on, tune in, and drop out. Um, do you think he deserves the kind of blame for for what happened with the prohibition? He deserves a lot of the blame. You, you can't squ- say that he was the only person. I actually, uh, f- uh, f- for this podcast, I actually made a list of a dozen other people slash factors that had led to what happened. And while more or less Larry deserves, I'll, I'll say this, he, does, he, he deserves the dishonor of having pushed back the uh, field of psychedelic research by three decades. Uh, pretty much all research had ended by 1970 because of the provisions of the Controlled Substances Act. And uh, modern research didn't really begin until uh, Rick Strassman's uh, DMT study and uh, Griffith's over at uh, Hopkins in the early 2000s. But um, just to give everyone a better idea of what uh, Timmy Leary was all about, um, before he was uh, the uh, high, known as the high priest of LSD, he was actually an eminent psychologist who had uh, become very influential within the uh, psychology community. He'd actually published um, a very influential work called The Interpersonal Diagnosis of Personality, which helped... Uh, which helped in the identification of various uh, personality types. Uh, and after flexing his charm uh, in front of a Harvard official, he had uh, he was able to uh, win his way into a position as a lecturer at Harvard, uh, not as a professor, like some people like to say that isn't technically true. He was a lecturer. Um, so uh, the middle-aged psych- uh, clinical psychologist secured his job at Harvard starting in uh, fall of 1960. And just weeks before he began his first semester, he vacationed in Mexico, of all places, and was given his uh, uh, first dose of uh, psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, uh, Essentially, um, uh, before this, he had only drank alcohol, hadn't even smoked cannabis. So this was a uh, much... uh, uh, all too different from the uh, alcohol-induced haze that he was used to uh, enjoying. Uh, he would reflect on his first experience at that Cuernavacan uh, hotel pool in really powerful terms that he had, quote, learned more in the six or seven hours of that experience than he had in all of his years as a psychologist. Um, once he returned to Massachusetts in the following weeks, he initiated the Harvard Psilocybin Project because he was just so enthralled by the potential of these medicines. Uh, he hadn't yet actually worked with LSE that came uh, uh, came in a year or two, but um, uh, he got uh, Dr. Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzer to join in the project with him. And while the vast majority of these studies were, explore, uh, were exploratory in nature, they unfortunately lacked the scientific rigor of modern clinical trials. Uh, they suffered from a lack of a control group, there was uh, the, uh, there was no double blind procedure, and um, so, so it didn't really. Uh, w- w- when we look back at these studies, they don't really. They don't give us the same confidence in the results. We, we can't achieve the same confidence in the results as we can with modern studies. Uh, w- with these sort of studies, they were simply just giving the compounds to people and having them describe their experiences. That was more or less it. Um, uh, shortly after these, uh, projects began, Alice, uh, Leary had actually taken LSD for the first time, uh, with the help of a friend. Uh, he had a very interesting and prophetic, uh, experience. Um, he was watching himself on a quote, ancient television show directed and designed by an unknown intelligence. And the role he played, in his own words, was that of, quote, the pathetic clown, the shallow, corny, 20th century American, the classic buffoon, completely caught up in a world of his own making. Uh, at this point in time, the press was still treating LSD and psilocybin favorably when describing the novel forms, uh, 
when describing the novel Pharmaceuticals, but now that there were these charismatic researchers at Harvard who were giving LSD and psilocybin to graduate students in, control, in controlled settings, the media was quick to sensationalize the topic as if it were the subject of some ongoing soap opera and, and it, uh, just to get away from it all. And in, uh, in April of 1962, Larry and his colleagues actually went down to Zihuatanejo, Mexico to rent out an entire hotel uh, for months, several months, a year at a time, something like that. Anyway, uh, so that they could essentially do as they pleased. Uh, routine LSD parties were described as research sessions, and this all came to a halt by June of 1963 when local newspapers had actually reported on what Leary was doing. Uh, one really interesting uh, article uh, alleged that he had brought with him, quote, marijuana orgies, hairy women, black magic, venereal disease, and profiteering, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, uh, sitting over to Antigua. Uh, Leary and his cohorts thought that they had found permanent refuge after they'd been kicked out of Mexico, but by August, their plans were derailed. Uh, one of their party goers had arrived at, uh, had uh, greeted a local lobotomist in town. He had uh, arrived, uh, shown up in a bathing suit and strung out from LSD. He had requested that the doctor perform a lobotomy on him because uh, as he as he said, he wanted to prevent Leary from, quote, making a pact with the devil. This didn't bode well for Leary and his friends. So they were kicked out of Antigua. And, uh, well, they decided to just try and turn on America instead. So um, it, it, it became more and more clear that he was impervious to the notion that he was on the wrong path. Um, as Hunter Thompson later put it, there were plenty of, quote, grim meat hook realities lying in wait for all the people who took him seriously. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. Uh, earlier in May, Leary had actually been fired uh, from his job as a lecturer at Harvard. He had essentially gone AWOL, just left the building, <laughs> never returned. Um, there was a... Uh, undergraduate thesis that he was supposed to review that was just lying on his desk. Spider webs had literally accumulated on top of it. Um, after he'd been fired, the scandal uh, inspired a bunch of international headlines. This inspired one reporter to come down to Mexico to get a quote from Larry to see you know, what he thought about the whole thing. And uh, with that trademark grin of his, uh, he told the reporter that he was, quote, honored and that it couldn't have happened to two nicer guys. Uh, the other nice guy uh, was Dr. Richard Alpert, who had unfortunately been fired for allegedly giving uh, undergraduates LSD in return for sexual favors. I have never been able to substantiate those claims and I don't think uh, Ram Dass ever, uh, he never really talked much about it, but that's definitely something to uh, discuss with the modern lens, I think. But anyway, um, uh, though the growing body of psychedelic research indicated an upcoming paradigm shift within the healthcare industry by 1963, black market LSD was now available as a street drug. And by this time, that political firebrand, Leary, had captured the nation's attention by touring the country to espouse the virtues of LSD. He actually upended the federal cannabis prohibition by, get this, uh, appealing a minor possession case all the way to the Supreme Court. He ran against Ronald Reagan for governor of California. This guy led a really interesting life. He aided drug smuggling operations. He escaped prison with the aid of domestic terrorists. He caught a $5 million bounty. He led the Nixon administration on a 28 month wild goose chase of an international manhunt, which ended in Afghanistan. He shared a fulsome prison cell block with Charlie Manson. Uh, in 1968, uh, then candidate Nixon described Timothy Leary as quote, the most dangerous man in America. 
uh, Leary would uh, reflect on this uh, honor and called, it, and, and called it his, quote, Nobel Prize. He really uh, enjoyed the uh, relationship that he had with Nixon, uh, for better or for worse. But uh, he effectively undermined the early psychedelic research movements and essentially invited a near outright moratorium on the entire field. And his morally bankrupt choice to advocate for the personal use of LSD at the time prompted concern by his colleagues in Harvard, those within governments, and um, interestingly, uh, unknown to most people, uh, Leary, uh, despite the fact that he was a well-educated Harvard lecturer and eminent psychologist, he'd actually diagnosed himself as a psychopath early in the uh, early 60s, late 50s, uh, early 60s. Uh, he, the story was that he was uh, at a relaxed uh, uh, event with Charles Slack, one of his colleagues, and he had um, gotten into this discussion uh, saying that, you know, you know, I really am a psychopath. And he asked uh, Charles Slack how many violations of the American Psychological Code of Ethics that he had made. Slack said, yeah, I don't think any, probably. And Leary had said that he had violated every single one, except those related to money. <sighs> so definitely something to think about, but um, getting back to uh, the national spotlight, his that six word anthem of his, turn on, tune in, drop out, that inspired countless young Americans to abandon contemporary culture, pursue psychedelic hedonism. He had effectively spent three decades subverting the will of the government by reminding his followers to quote, think for yourself and question authority. Now, uh, this, uh, <laughs> uh, he rarely minced words, especially in public speaking events. Uh, in February of 1967, he was addressing students at the University of Toronto, and he had told them that, quote, you must drop out of school. Your education system is a narcotic, addictive process, end quote, supported by a, quote, madhouse government, end quote, comprised of, get this, quote, almost senile and probably impotent men, end quote, shipping the nation's youth out to war. Uh, but perhaps the most shocking of Leary's public statements uh, came from his open letter of a prison escape note. After the uh, weatherman had helped him escape jail, he had uh, uh, released a letter where he had informed his, quote, comrades that shooting a quote genocidal police excuse me a genocidal robot policeman in the defense of life is a sacred act these sort of messages did not play well with most americans especially those with conservative values and because of this the medical utilization of lsd and related substances often became conflated with the lifestyle and philosophies that larry helped promote and uh uh, just to give people a better idea of how he escaped prison, this is a really interesting story. Uh, in September of 1970, the 49-year-old high priest of LSD uh, was locked up after having been denied bail for a marijuana possession charge. Uh, snubbing his nose at the political establishment, he had actually left a small newspaper article that was affixed to his prison-issued prison footlocker. In the article were quotes by then Governor Ronald Reagan, you know, the guy he ran against. Uh, and there were underlined quotes saying that Leary should, uh, that Leary was not a, uh, th that he was not a threat to the public and that he should uh, deserve to be placed in a minimum security prison. The gall of this guy. So he uh, gets out into the yard, scales the perimeter of the jail climbs hand over hand across a telephone wire for I think like 50 yards, shimmies down a telephone pole and awaits for this unmarked vehicle to come pick him up. He shaves his head bald, <laughs> uh, 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 gets a forged passport and eventually makes his way over to Algeria where he uh, temporarily lives in exiled chapter of the Black Panther Party. 
this just makes for really interesting press for Larry and the movement itself. Uh, and by the time that Larry's in Algeria, Nixon was becoming aware of his dropping ratings, approval ratings, that is. And uh, he privately admitted to Treasury Secretary uh, John Connolly that he felt that his work wasn't getting through to the American people. Uh, so in an effort to change the spirits of the president, uh, uh, Connolly had, in his own special way, uh, suggested to the president that it might be a good idea to vilify the symbolic leader of the drug, uh, the drug epidemic, to the extent that it's stuck in the minds of people. Now, Nixon thought this was a good idea. This could uh, definitely, uh, this could definitely do something for his ratings. Now, there was a bunch of cross talk in the Oval Office, and uh, Connolly, uh, with his th thick Southern draw. Uh, reminds everyone about the the guy who went to Algeria. Now, now that everyone's laughing about the reference to Leary, uh, Nixon turtled that. Well, we definitely have room in the prison system for him. Nixon was really lucky. The, the most perfect scapegoat for the drug epidemic had literally fallen into his hands. Less than a week after, yeah, less than a week after newspapers began reporting that. Uh, Leary had found refuge in Algeria. Nixon had signed the Controlled Substances Act into law. I mean, the, the, the timing is just really, yeah. And uh, interestingly, by the time that uh, he was caught, that was within a week of Nixon's uh, second inauguration in 1972. The timing is just really interesting in all these things. <laughs> 